Welcome to the 74 Weld YouTube channel. My name's Quinn. My goal here on all these videos is very simple. It's to answer the question of why. And in answering that question, we will inherently provide you with education, detailed insight into why we do what we do, and put this stuff into context that you care about for your own application in off-road. What's up everyone? Quinn with 74 Weld, joined with Eric today. He's doing a quick little diagram we're gonna be talking about bearings. Um, specifically, we're gonna talk about bearings for our application, but the concepts that we're gonna talk about apply to essentially every bearing that an applicant, or every bearing um, that would be used in any application, because we're gonna talk about simple concepts, uh, bearing strength, bearing applications, thrust loads. What else are we talking about? Um, we'll define a bunch of these terms for you. We'll tell you when you'd want to use a certain bearing. And I think the only bearing that we don't have, oh, you drew it. Uh, yeah, I drew the angular contact. Oh, I do have an angular contact. Okay. So Eric's going to start the breakdown. I'm going to grab an angular contact bearing. Start with ball bearing? Yeah, so ball bearings are probably, I don't even want to say they're the most common. Let's flip our board around. Yeah. So the cross section would be this okay, guy so right here. These are typically known as deep V groove ball bearings. Um, these are really good all around bearings. You have a ball that runs in a V track or a, a grooved track. Um, the beauty of a ball bearing is it's rated for radial load, it can handle thrust loads. And I guess it's good that we're talking about this. Yeah. Before we dive into bearings, let's define radial load and thrust load. Yeah. So radial is going to be, say you have a, a stationary shaft, a moving hub, something like that. Radial is going to be along the radius. So yep. bearing the weight of a vehicle would be an example of a radial load. Okay. And yeah. what is an axial load? An axial load is going to be down that shaft axis. So like if you're cornering the corner load, um, yep. you know, that's going to allow you to turn. Okay. So those are the two loads that you're going to see or some type of combination yep. between the two of them. Um, a perfect example of where this would be used would be on the back of a transfer case. They're typically going to run a ball bearing because while you need to stabilize that back tail shaft of a transfer case, it's going to see whipping loads from a drive line. So it's going to see both axial and radial loads simultaneously. These are pretty good at that. Um, and we did grab on most of this stuff with the exception of a needle bearing because you'll never find a needle bearing with the same dimensions as a ball bearing. But bearings are measured, and this is a cool thing, yeah. bearings are measured by inside diameter, outside diameter, and then overall width. Yeah. And so you could take... While this is going to be a slightly wider bearing, it's the same inside diameter, same outside diameter between the two. And we did that for you today so that we can start comparing numbers as to, yeah. let's put this, let's put a quantitative value to it and go, this bearing handles this much force, this bearing handles this much, this bearing handles this much, same yeah. size totally different load ratings. Yeah, and then also just all the caveats and disclaimers. When we give numbers, these are just uh, metrics to be able to compare across different bearing types. Yeah. Every, every number is situational, depending on combination of axial loads, radial loads, lubrication, um, what your bearing stack is. There, there's a lot of different and things that go into And bearings it. are always rated for two different loads, right? Yeah. There's static and dynamic. Yep, there's static, dynamic, and then there's different ways to measure those because it's like, say you have a dynamic load. That's not... <laughs> The, you know, that could be at whatever RPMs, whatever heat. So, and then RPM also, comes into play yeah, too. Bearing life. So, like um, L10 life would be 
all right, 90 million revolutions, 90% of bearings will live at this load. Right. So, so we're going to kind of give basic numbers, know that there's a lot more factors involved in it. Yeah. Um, These are just comparisons between types. Yeah. Really. So, okay, so start us off. Yeah. All right, cool. So <laughs> kind of went through the, the ball bearing. Um, so just for our, I guess, general numbers. So this one per SKF, we have a dynamic rating of 5,100 pounds, static rating of 3,500 pounds, fatigue rating of 160 pounds. So that's a load at which the bearing will not fatigue. So it's kind of like an infinite life um, value. Okay. And then axial thrust. So there's not a lot of, uh, you're not going to get like a number for axial loads from most bearings because um, it depends. <laughs> right, because an axial load could be straight. It could have an angular component to yeah. it. Um, yeah, and it's also a factor of how much radial load do you have on that bearing as In well. conjunction with axial load, mm -hmm. right. And then some bearings, like, they won't work without a radial component, or they won't work properly without a radial component as well. So okay. they can't give you a pure axial rating. So to uh, overcomplicate things, we... Yeah, <laughs> all right, sorry. <laughs> um, right there. Next bearing. Yeah, so tapered roller bearing. So 10 degree, 15 degree? I don't know what this one is, but yeah, it's going to be I think there are somewhere 10, around there. So, and when I say 10 to 15 degree, we're talking about the angle of the taper on this roller. Um, this runs a ball. This runs a cylindrical roller at an yeah. angle. So it's going to be like this guy here. So, so this is like axle center line here, and this is a cross section. So you're going to have your inner race, outer race, and then rolling element in the middle. OK. That's what, what these mean. Um, we didn't grab it with this, but here is a cylindrical roller. Yep. These will typically have a separate inner race. So just Im as I drop stuff, imagine that the inner diameter of this is the same because it has a hardened race on the inside. Um, real quick, most bearings are going to be a material called 52100. It is just commonly used in bearings. You have a second, which would be E52100, which is a double electric furnace vacuum melt. It's a slightly higher quality. We run E52100 bearings in all of our applications. It's just a little bit better bearing, and it doesn't add too much to cost. Um, so cylindrical roller. Yeah. As you see, these bearings both have cylindrical rollers in them. Yeah. One is at an angle, one is straight. Yeah, so tapered roller, cylindrical roller. Right. You can have cylindrical rollers with no flange on the ID, so the shaft can slide infinitely. You could have it with a flange on one side, or you could have a double flanged cylindrical roller. Yeah. For our applications, we use a single flange cylindrical roller. That flange just helps center whatever's in between it. It is not meant for thrust. Yeah, yeah. I've seen cylindrical rollers used in applications that generate thrust. It is a terrible idea. It will grenade. It might not grenade in a day. It might take a little while. But you cannot add axial thrust to a cylindrical roller bearing. Yeah. They're not so. rated for it. And while this isn't necessarily rated for it, yeah. it's very well known. So the SKF, the manufacturer, will not put a rating on axial thrust load on this, but it can handle it for sure. Yeah. So they have somewhere I was reading a general guideline of use 25% of the static load rating. So like this is a 5,100 pound dynamic radial load bearing, but it's only 875 pounds okay. axial load given that guideline. So the NJ? Yeah. Um, NJ1010, ECP. Uh, yeah. This is not ECP because ECP refers to the cage. So the cage on a bearing like this, see the gold part? That's brass. That is the cage. That cage holds those rollers in place. Yeah. So uh, radial load of this bearing compared to this. Yeah. 
So now we're at 11,900 pounds dynamic. Okay. So, so same over out, double. Yeah, so same outside diameter, same inside diameter, more than double the load rating in one direction, yep. only in a radial load. Yeah. This cannot take axial load. So this is where specking stuff matters. Yeah. And kind of as an example, so this is a needle bearing. We'll get to those, but you can see the race just pops in and out. Yeah. There's zero pounds. To that would that you can get a you can get this same style race to, that would slide all the way through. That would be an NU bearing. And the cool yeah. thing about bearings is across every manufacturer, the bearing numbers are all the same. So it's not like SKF has one number and Timken has a separate number. That's the one of the greatest things about bearings is if you cross reference the number you can pick that out of any different manufacturer. We have our preferences and likes. Yeah. We're not gonna dive into that. Um, but know that if you look at a bearing, that bearing will have a number on it and you can cross-reference that number yeah. to any manufacturer. So, tapered roller. Yeah. So, no axial load, or axial load, no axial load. Pretty good at axial load. Yeah, so tapered rollers are a really good bearing for the yeah. right application. Um, commonly used in hubs. Yeah, gearboxes, like uh, ring and pinion gear sets. Now, this bearing is going to be wider than this with yeah. the same dimensions, and that's because um, I mean, they just make them wider. <laughs> so the, the outer race, or they'll call it the cup, will yeah. be the same form factor as the outer race of one of these. But, but just wider. Yeah, they just they cheat them. <laughs> the, so. so this has a load rating of 16,800 pounds. Yep, so over triple the ball bearing, 50% more than yep. cylindrical roller. But that's also, keep in mind, they're longer rollers in there. So Right, so. Because they, they add that width to and it. And needle bearings typically will have longer rollers than cylindrical yeah. bearings. Um, needle bearings are, are used in applications where your OD and ID are fairly close. So that needle has, um, it's smaller in diameter and it's yeah. longer. The, and you can also run, and I know this um, because like I've, Jason at TubeWorks, in his underdrives, he runs um, a needle bearing without, so the needle bearing also has a cage in it. You can run needle bearings uncaged, and you can do a full complement needle, and then remove one needle from that, and the needles will still float slightly, and you'll get a higher load rating out of that, because essentially the more surface area you add, the greater the load rating as a general rule of thumb. Yeah. Um, angular contact. Yeah. So it, it like looks like a ball. Here. So angular contact bearings have balls in them, but if you'll see here, the contact point is kind of diagonal. Um, yeah. Angular contacts are specifically designed for axial and radial thrust simultaneously. And these are typically going to be at, I don't want to get this 30, wrong. 30, 40 degrees. 30 to 40 or even 45 yeah. degree angular contact. So, there you go. So yeah, you can look at your contact on both tapered roller and angular contact. They look the same. It's because he's a shitty artist. Yeah. Better at engineering than art. <laughs> That's all right. Um, 15 degree, call this a 40 to 45 degree, yeah. 30 degree. These are actually, we actually have a lot of experience with angular contact because a lot of lathe spindles have gone to angular contact yeah. because on a lathe, you're typically putting a lot of both cutter pressure into the part as well as moving down the Z axis. Um, a great bearing. These are typically more expensive. Yeah. Angular contacts are just an expensive bearing. I don't know why. I think it's, if I was to speculate, maybe they're harder to make. I don't know. Yeah, it they're, also depends. They're on more the, expensive. Yeah, um, 
like so with taper rollers and angular contacts, you're gonna have directionality of thrust. Yes. And a lot of the angular contacts, like if you wanna have one single angular contact bearing that will deal with thrust in both ways, um, what they do is have the outer race captures the ball on both sides, and then you have an inner race that's in two parts. Yeah. And that has to be precision ground to be able to. That's set true. The so that would be it. a four point angular yeah. contact. We've used those in applications in the past. One of the overarching themes on this is there is no bearing that is better than another. Yeah. There are, it, it comes down to specking the right bearing for the right application. That's what matters. Yeah. So brief overview on these. Um, I don't think RPM necessarily pertains to us. No, uh, yeah, we're pretty low RPMs on yeah. the portals. Portals spin at a very low RPM. I've said this a bunch, huge misconception. We get compared to a transmission. Yeah. That's stupid because a transmission might spin at, let's say you have an overdrive gear and your motor revs to 6,000 RPM. Dude, that transmission could be going at 9,000 RPM. Yeah. At 80 miles an hour on the freeway in a Bronco, you're spinning at 712 RPM. Yeah. We don't care about RPM. Um, so we're not even gonna touch that point. Yeah. So let's then dive into why do we spec the bearings that we do? Yeah. And that comes down to where are the loads coming from? Yeah. So we run a straight cut gear set. There's two main reasons why. First, straight cut is always going to be more efficient than a helical. The reason for that is they roll together. There is no thrust load. Yeah. So the, the, the whole other end of the spectrum on that is gonna be a worm gear. Yeah. We don't have a worm gear here. Um, but if you've ever had an RC crawler and you've had a worm gear for the ring and pinion, yeah. a worm gear will not roll. Like you physically can't get it to roll unless it has power being applied to it because the gear set is 90 degrees off of, the ring gear is 90 degrees off the pinion. And so a hypoid gear set, which is typically used in a ring and pinion, is going to be known as a wedging gear. That is, it's 90 degrees off, but then there's a taper to the pinion. So that decreases the amount of rolling resistance in it. Um, in a portal, you could run probably up to a 10 degree helix. Uh, Mercedes Benz in their Unimogs was a funky like nine and change helix. They probably did that for proprietary reasons. Um, but as you move on a helix, you are increasing thrust load and that you will lose efficiency because that is going to run hotter because you're inducing thrust into the system. Yeah. So on all of our stuff, we run a straight cut gear and I'm not going to touch today on point loading of a helical gear set because a helix will get you more surface area, but that doesn't necessarily equate to more strength because you have a concept called point loading. There's a difference between theoretical gear sets and practical gear sets because of the way they're, they're made. Um, so we'll stick to, we run a straight cut gear set. Why do we do that? It really comes down to bearing package. Yep. So, Let's talk about bearing package. Um, we run on the upper gear. Cylindrical roller with yep. a flanged inner race. On the idlers. Cylindrical roller with a flanged inner race. And on the lower, our gear indexes into the unit bearing, which contains two tapered rollers to yep. be able to handle thrust at the wheel. In conjunction with that, we hollow out our gear yep. and we put a needle bearing in. And the reason we run a needle is because your ID and OD can be 
fairly close in size. It's the strongest bearing that we can spec for that application. Needles are super common. Yeah. Um, and it packages well. It packages in that space. well. So. And we don't run needles on our upper gear or our lower. Yeah. Because I don't think you really find flanged needle bearings. No, no, and we want those flanges in there. So the lower gear is essentially bolted to the back of the unit bearing. Yeah, so, it's so not the lower gear anywhere. is captured. Yeah. The reason we run a flanged cylindrical roller in our idlers and our upper gear is because we actually allow that gear to float. Yeah. How much? Like 20 thou. Okay. So. so five sheets of paper. Yeah. So if you stack five sheets of paper up, that's how much float we have in our whole system. Yeah. And the flanges on the inner race allow it to float and then stop. Yeah. Otherwise, your gear would float into the bearing or the aluminum yeah. case, and that would be bad. Yep. And so our first, um, you know, if you've watched our uh, Jeep video on the 1.19 original oh, yeah. setup, we had a hollow idler gear with the needle bearing in the middle. And, and we, then, yep. Yeah, we had um, bronze flat plane bearings yep. on each side to, so it could bump into those. And then that became a wear item. So actually having the flanged race is better because it's a hardened steel part that's not going to wear. Yeah. Like and that. it eliminated part numbers. One of the things that I am always trying to do yeah. is get rid of part numbers in our system. So. I've said this in other videos, I'll say it again here. The hardest thing to do is engineer something simple. Yeah. And we're gonna shoot another video where we open up the portal and we rip everything apart and put it all back together so that you can see it is really simple inside. Um, and it takes a lot of work to get to that simplicity. Yeah. So wherever we can, we're gonna run a flange cylindrical roller. Yeah. Um, in theory, that flange could, you could push against that flange. Yeah. Um, it's a terrible idea, but, and I've seen this in applications where people will put a flange cylindr cylindrical roller in a helical gear set um, and it does not hold up, it does not live. Yeah. So, with all of this stuff, you've got to understand, and the cool thing about this is, there's just a book, or there's books that bearing manufacturers put out that give you yeah. all the details of this. It's not like, I didn't go to school to learn about bearings, you just pick up a book. Yeah. So SKF has a phenomenal book. I think SKF's website, um, no matter whether we run SKF in an application or not, their website is phenomenal. Yeah. Their database is amazing. They have full 3D models of every bearing that they yeah. make. Um, SKF is a, the best resource on the web for bearings. Yeah. So if you want to learn about them, that's where I would start. Definitely. You can go in and create systems in their website and it'll tell you what your expected life is. So like, take this guy, 12,000 pound dynamic load rating. Well, I want to run it at 20. Let's see what happens. You can plug it into their calculators and say, all right, here's my ambient temperature. Here's my lubrication. Here's where my other bearings are. Here's all my loads. Yeah. And it'll say, okay, well, this is rated for 1 million revolutions. You took that to 700,000. All right, sweet. You know. Now. So I think we've done this. Um, What's the expected lifespan of our bearing package in our portal? Based on a perfect scenario with SKF's calculation. Yeah, I mean, so we're keeping everything like under normal driving conditions to as close to these fatigue limits as possible, which would be, you know, it's not gonna wear out. If you look at like say 25% of guys are running it like you know, pretty hard all of the time, that would get to that 90 million, um, or not 90 million, um, I forget what the millions of revolutions number is that we go for the, you know, harder duty ones. And then 
you know, heavy duty, once you get into that, we would consider that more of a race car application yeah. where you better prep your stuff. So well, we're looking at, we're looking at, you know, over 90 million revolutions on our applications. Yeah. And that sounds like a huge number. Yeah. It adds up quickly though. It adds up quickly. So, <laughs> so I mean, expect, I tell people expect that you're going to get more life out of our bearings in a normal application than you will out of the vehicle. Um, I can tell you that we've got race cars that have gone several years on, on the same bearings and racing application is kind of the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. It's short duration, super heavy loads. And so there's kind of on all of this stuff, there's finding that happy medium as to what works for that specific application. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what about tapered rollers? So, well, I guess it applies oh. to the, oh, okay. No, go, sorry. All right, tapered rollers and angular contacts, right? It takes thrust in one direction. So how does that work in a wheel hub? Um, you end up with two tapered rollers. And if you remember from earlier, so, there's um, an angle to them and um, typically 10 to 15 degrees yeah so you can set them up in two different ways you can have a dual opposed tapered roller well so basically that angle is going to dictate your bearing centers ah uh, yes oh this is so, a super good topic to talk on bearing centers yeah. equating to bearing strength yeah I've talked about in a different video, gear centers equating to gear strength. Yeah. Bearing centers equating to bearing strength is a big one as well. Yes. And by bearing centers, what we mean is if you're going to pretend this is a uh, tapered roller, if you're going to have two tapered rollers next to each other or two <laughs> tapered rollers spread this far apart, you have a much different strength yeah. to the combination of the two. Yeah. So it's the whiteboard's kind of getting messed up. The whiteboard up, sucks. But, well, yeah. But if you think of the angle of the roller, you can draw an imaginary line. And so your two rollers, they're going to give you a point here, right? So, so it's going to give you a point in space. Point in space. Yeah. So depending on how you orient those rollers, either this way or that way, your points are going to be farther or closer to one another. Okay. And um, so that's going to be like, you know, if you're trying to resist rotation, would you rather be out here or in here? You want to be out here. So bearing spread comes into play on a lot of this yeah. stuff. Now, where we're constrained is we're not trying to make a package super wide. Yeah. Um, that's another reason why we pick a cylindrical roller with a straight cut gear. But also keep in mind that this bearing here has to be preloaded. Yes. Yeah. And by preload, what we mean is if if you put the bearing in the race, and I'm over exaggerating, out here, it's gonna float around and it'll, it'll fail because it's only gonna contact at certain points. If you over torque this bearing, you'll have a concept called brunelling, and brunelling is where the physical roller indents itself into the race, and that's super bad. So I'll jump backwards when I first started doing a race application for a two gear portal, we ran, because Mercedes Benz ran these, we ran these in the upper gear. And while they can handle a lot of load, from an assembly standpoint, it was a massive pain in the ass because the way that I would read preload on this bearing is with inch pounds of rotational yeah. torque load without the seal in place. So when I was assembling these, I would have to sit there with no seals in the portal because seals will add rolling resistance and give you a false reading. And we'd have to shim this constantly yeah. to get the preload we wanted. Um, we wanted a couple inch pounds. I think it was, it's been six or seven years since I did this. I think I wanted like 15 inch pounds Sounds of rolling right. resistance in that. If you torque this, let's say to 70 foot pounds, yeah. um, expect the bearing to explode, expect the bearing to Brunel the race. It's not gonna happen overnight, but 
you cannot over torque a tapered roller or you'll ruin the race and then you'll ruin the roller. So from a assembly standpoint, putting tapered rollers in without the ability to externally adjust that preload becomes a royal pain in the ass and we just won't do it. Yeah. It's also a wider bearing package and width is a constant concern for us. Yeah. And so you need some mechanism to be able to set that. Yep. And then, yeah. Yeah. And the other side of it is like in a hub, you might have end play and you don't want end play in a gear set because that's right. essentially going to be a gap between here that you'll be able to pull in and out. And what end play will also do in a gear set is it'll allow the gears to misalign. Yeah. And that equates to that concept that I didn't want to talk about earlier, but point loading on a gear set. So while you may have this much surface area between a gear set, if you point load it at all, now you just have one single point of contact where you think, oh, I've got all this surface area. No, you're actually point loading a gear. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why we don't run a helical gear because in a perfect constrained world, it's more surface area. In the real world, it's not you are going to have deflection of the case. You're going to have deflection of the, of the bearing because you can't over tighten this. Yeah. And so if you have any deflection, now you're point loading that gear set yeah. and that leads to shorter lifespan. Yeah. And then kind of, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. If not, we can put a JPEG oh. of it. Yeah. So this would be preload versus end play, right? So, this would be the end play side. This would be preload side. This is like a perfect net fit there. And then Y axis is bearing life. So you can see a net fit with a little bit of preload. That's going to be your typically most ideal for bearing life and longevity. Yep. Um, end play you can see is a lot more forgiving because preload will just fall off a cliff. Actually, I think I drew this wrong because I'm pretty sure it just goes straight down. And to kind of illustrate um, the scale that we're talking about here, this region, so an end play, it's measured in thousandths of an inch. You know, this optimal re region is up to five thousandths of an inch typically. Okay. And then in the preload side, you're talking like on a Dana 70 gear set, I don't know if it's something like 30 inch pounds. That's kind of one of the heavier specs. Yeah. Cause you can't measure negative interference really. It's just stacking up. So it's a very narrow band that you're going to be so, actually. So you have a very narrow window of where yeah. this bearing is going to be happy. Yeah. And if you're outside of that window, this tapered roller handles 16,800 pounds. That is going to be in a perfect scenario at the yeah. top of that bell curve. Yeah. It's going to fall off huge if you over torque and it's going to fall off huge if you under torque. Yeah. So and same goes for angular contacts too. So, but you can get those preset from the factory. So this can, is a preset angular yeah. contact. Now the four point angular contact that we used in a two gear application a long time ago, the race, the inner race, and it was an extremely expensive bearing. It's like a $500 bearing. But that inner race was precision ground by the manufacturer and you would torque that thing to, it doesn't matter whether it's at 50 pounds or 500 pounds, the preload was set by the manufacturer, not by us. And so that would be a bearing that we could use in that application, but $500 bearing versus yeah. $40 bearing, I mean. Yeah, it's kind of a no brainer. Yeah. And yeah, and then like tapered rollers, they're cheaper too. And there's there's other, you know, from the factory, you can get things like crush sleeves where it's a one-time torque where yep. it'll set it. Or like race car guys will do a, you know, solid spacer where they'll just machine a spacer until it's set right. Yeah. But again, that all, we're not doing the volumes to make our own crush sleeve and we don't want to make our own solid well, spacers. And it also comes down to, we don't need to do all of that stuff. No. We spec the right bearing for our application, and this just makes it so much easier. So if you go to service our stuff, crack it open, the gears will pop right out, throw it back together, throw it together. There's no preload needed on anything, and it's, it just makes it easier. Yeah, definitely. Hope you enjoyed the video.
Uh, yeah. <laughs> bearings are a massive undertaking. Yeah. Uh, and we didn't, I mean, I think we barely scratched the surface on it, but yeah. our goal is to basically give you a little bit of information on why we spec the bearings that we do. And if we can give a little education, then when you look at other applications, you'll go, oh, that's a tapered roller bearing. Yeah. Hopefully you learned it from us. Yeah, hopefully so. <laughs> um, cool. So. We appreciate your time. Right on. Oh, yeah. Subscribe to our YouTube. Yeah, like, comment, subscribe. Yeah. Everything that we said wrong. Tell me my inch pounds are incorrect down below. And throw it in the comments. Yeah. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this type of content, subscribe to our channel. It helps us grow and provide you guys with more informative, good content, and we'll see you on the next one.